Hello, this is the Open ZFS call for August 16th, and we have Alan, Jude, Anthony, Jason, and myself, Michael, and we've been bantering, but Anthony has some questions about how best to have either immutable infrastructure or easily destroyed infrastructure, and go ahead, Anthony, describe what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, thanks. So the, the idea is to go from the, the concept of storing data and having it reproducible or accessible to um, just kind of a build process where we build a basic desktop, configure it externally, separation, separate configuration and policy and all of that good stuff, uh, and then just produce a, you know, a small lightweight desktop with, say, your basic office applications. And then at the end of the day, the idea is, um, or sorry, once it's deployed, then you would just configure your application. So like there's no need to have three three years of email and Outlook or whatever you're using for email. So just pull down the last two weeks just to make like a really portable and lightweight working desktop. And then at the the at the end of the day, you basically just destroyed the desktop because somewhere in your infrastructure, you would have a golden image that you're basically creating that user's workspace on and then just applying the policy to. So during the course of using the desktop, I guess you could say it would periodically report back and uh, replicate any changes to the golden image. So the next time the desktop was built, it would incorporate yesterday's changes, so as to speak. And then I, I just thought that would be a really good use case and uh, to apply ZFS um, in that you would also be able to snapshot and clone everything and then um, move anything anywhere you wanted, basically. So that was kind of the, the conceptual idea. I just was you looking mentioned... for some ideas or pointers or software on how to accomplish that. Well, so you mentioned desktops, but you also mentioned perhaps a hypervisor. Is the desktop itself that someone's sitting down at something like a VNC session, or is it actually booted to something you've retrieved from the server? Well, I've got a Beehive loading a VM that is configured to deploy a desktop. But how and do you see that as a user? RDP? Um, uh, yeah, you can do RDP. Something? Yeah, okay. exactly. Got it. Hmm. Uh, it sounds a bit like something I've done in the past with ZFS, uh, especially around the golden images, where we build, uh, you know, the same golden image to put on, you know, a hundred different servers, uh, but each one would then have a separate data set for its local changes, uh, of you know, its configuration that's you know its IP address and things that that need to persist. Um, so, kind of in your example there, separating out the desktop and the applications, which might be the same for every user, from their mail spool, which will be different for every user. Uh, and then that way, you know, every time you stand it up, you're getting your application back to the same spot, but your preferences and your, you know, the last week of your email or whatever are a, a separate data set that, you know, only the one user has access to and can be replicated. Or, you know, depending on how disposable the machine is meant to be or whatever, it might be that the data set that contains, you know, my email while I'm working on it kind of thing is a ZFS data set that's encrypted with a key. And you know when I want to log off, I'm going to destroy that key so that the next user could never see my email or whatever. Um, but you know the, the data set containing the actual applications and the desktop and, and all the common bits uh, stay separate and, and you know wouldn't have to be reloaded every time, but could just be periodically updated. So trying to separate the the common bits, the application and the, the desktop environment itself from the user specific data that you would want to, you know, uh, replicate and and not, you know, revert every time somebody uh, spins up another one of these or whatever. You get away with a home directory in this case, or would you need most a, like, yeah, if you're using something like something if you're more. using Thunderbird, then yeah, is everything lives in the one user's home directory. Right. And so you can have the the system image be one thing and the uh, home directories be separate data sets in that way. You're only having to feed back the changes to their home directory to you know, your central storage so that when they log in at some other machine, it uh, can pull that down and, and use it. 
So um, I'll give an example of uh, one of my workflows. So instead of taking my laptop home um, on the bike, I, I will actually uh, have a virtual machine at home with um, our corporate image. So um, the machine at home is a free BSD host. And then I have a Windows 11 Beehive uh, hypervisor running on that same machine. Now, that's running on a, its own ZFS data set and the ZFS data set's encrypted. So basically when the, the before the guest VM, the Windows 11 VM can boot, it actually has to be mounted. So the, the data set has to be unlocked and then, then it can be um, ZFS mounted and then the Beehive loads. Basically what happens is that um, same data set is snapshot. I, I snapshot it once a day. And then it's replicated to th two different hosts. So two different hosts connect back to that main um, hypervisor and pulls down that snapshot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so what happens is then an encrypted snapshot of that hypervisor lives in two different locations. Um, nobody can get to it because it's, it's obviously locked. Um, but if I need to pull that back down, I can um, send it back to the host or if it becomes corrupted like Windows Update, has a bit of a hissy fit and and falls over and uh, kills the image. I can basically, if I can either roll back on that um, hypervisor or pull it back from uh, the two two replicated servers. Um, so everything is there as it is. I can roll back at any point in time where I need to, um, and it work lives in an encrypted container. So um, it meets our security requirements from a work perspective. Wow, those are really great points. Thanks. Jason, in the end, how you mentioned a FreeBSD workstation. How are you actually accessing Windows over RDP and a, and a FreeBSD RDP client? Yeah, so um, the my my workstation home is, uh, I'm like Alan, I don't mind what I use. And my workstation home is a Windows 10 workstation um, that's my desk play games and that sort of stuff on, but I use RDP into that Windows 11 guest and then perform everything inside RDP. RDP is really, really good these days. Um, uh, and yeah, I just assigned 16 gig of, um, of free BSD RAM to that guest for vCPUs. Um, I use NVMe for the underlying storage, the emulator, the NVMe emulator in, in Beehive and VertIO net for the network so yeah it it's basically faultless we did have some issues uh with it i don't know if it was a microsoft thing or if it was an issue with the upgrading instance inside windows 11 so top, this is probably a slight uh, more of a beehive discussion but <clears throat> we thought it was a secure boot tpm issue it may have been uh, because i had issues remaking and and installing a tpm uh a tpm free windows 11 instance i tested yesterday it's back to how it was and my patches have been applying again to my um uh, guest hypervisor so um yeah there's no problems with using windows 11 under beehive and then you know zfs just makes life so much easier yeah i think that's similar to what i'm doing now the only thing i hadn't been able to figure out was how to run um um nested vms but that would probably be more of a beehive call uh, yeah, dude, Beth doesn't support that currently oh, okay. it's long been thought that that is so complex and error prone and only costs vmware three million dollars or more to implement over three years uh, it's not desirable and if you do need that functionality i say spin up kvm on debian and you get much of that. And for what it's worth, Beehive was developed on, on VMware Fusion in a coffee shop. So nesting's not unattractive per se, but it's a, a, unattractive to Beehive. No, oh, that's fair enough. So uh, lots yeah. of people are running Beehive inside another hypervisor, but you can't use Beehive as the outside one because it doesn't do the nesting. extra ne nesting. Right. right. Academically, this... there was talk of having like an adjacent VM that appears to be at the mercy of the first one, but that's not really hit anything down an idea. Go ahead. The um, there was some people have run performance things for uh, seeing how deep they can go into nesting um, on KVM, for example, 
And by the time they get to fourth, I mean, a Raspberry Pi just makes it, smokes it, basically. So, you know, anything more than too deep, you're basically getting into a point why. So um, just just utilise the whole host VM, unless you've got um, security, security boundaries that you've got issues with. Uh, those security boundaries become irrelevant um, when there's a flaw in the CPU microcode. So <laughs> all bets are off again there. So there's no real security benefit of going nested as well. I didn't okay. know it would nest beyond once. That's impressive. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I was... KVM will nest up to four uh, to a point where it becomes you, you can't do anything, but yeah. No, that's fair enough. I was just using it to actually cheat. <laughs> as a kind of a bootstrap instance to do something else, not necessarily to run full OSs. Uh, well, thanks very much. Um, how are you currently tools? using ZFS? Um, currently, I have a FreeBSD host running 13.1 with Beehive, and then I have like. Um, the other fellow said that data sets separated off for all my VMs. Um, and then I'm using salt okay. to manage everything with um, grains to do my basic uh, stuff that way. And then I was going to try and um, I was going to try and uh, get some sort of Windows friendly environment under Beehive. So it would be I've actually got Windows what is it, 20, I don't even know what they call it anymore, the data server, the newest one, running under Beehive, and that's, that's fine. 2022. Um, I don't know, whatever it is. I'm not a Windows guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so that functionality works great. And I was just thinking uh, of going one step further because I would have some applications that I want to deploy in more of a Linux environment, and I don't want to use the Windows subsystem because it doesn't do what I need. So I was just thinking I could cheat and and uh, you know have a s small lightweight VM perform that operation under the Windows, but it's already being hosted under Beehive, so it wasn't working for me. And I was, now that you explain why, that makes sense. <laughs> so thanks. You were asking about tools. Is this just for the replication, or yeah, just like what what would be best. Um, practice to look at or what what's being used in industry now as, as kind of the gold standard is it like um you know like i'm the most using popular salt. tool oh yeah, uh, yeah well the most popular tool for the doing zfs replication would be sanoid and syncoid sanoid and syncoid okay yes. never heard of them i'll have to look at yeah. that um because yeah there are quite a few other tools as well to managing zfs replication but they're all uh, about the same, just designed for different use cases. Like I think ZREPL is really designed around the use case of backing up your laptop, which is you know quite a bit different than necessarily what you're trying to do with uh, replicating a, a VM host to another machine to be able to have a kind of a warm spare uh, to be able to fail over. Hmm. Yeah, I can I can I concur with Alan there. Um, I was using uh, Alan's um, was it uh, ZFS. Uh, Z -X -er. uh, Z -Xer. Z -Xer. I didn't uh, write that, uh, by the way. That's originally some know, Solaris got, guy, and I'm just the maintainer. Yeah, it's got your uh, additional um, bits yeah. and pieces in it. But um, yeah, I wanted progress bar support. Yeah. Um, so I, I was use ZFS Snap 2, and I think it's CPL bar and that sort of stuff. The few of those bits and pieces. But um, yeah, I've moved our uh organizational infrastructure over the sanoid syncoid because it just it's a lot it's a lot easier to manage um uh, from a from a cleaning up the snapshot point of view and replication of snapshot point of view so um yeah that's a thumbs up there for me as well yeah zx for is uh only like 70 percent of the solution you have to bribe the rest yourself so it's not a very nice out-of-the-box solution where sanoid and syncoid just does what you want uh, out of the box and is much more configurable rather than having to write your own tools around it. Well, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I had no idea those existed. It's always good to find new toys. <laughs> yeah, so Sanoid will take care of the setting up whatever snapshot policy you want, and Syncoid will be able to then copy those snapshots to uh, another machine. 
Okay, that's cool. And do you um, do you use your own messenger, like um, Salt or Agent or Configuration Manager, with that to to replicate that, or is that all contained within the that pair? Yeah, so uh, it uses I mean, SSH to connect to the other hosts, uh, and then I guess this config file could come from your Salt if you wanted to to provide this configuration by a Salt. Okay, cool, perfect. Uh, so on our side, we use Puppet, and we're just you know we create the the cron tab to run it and the, put the config file in place from uh, Puppet, and then it just runs and does this thing. Makes sense. Okay, perfect. Um, might be we slightly have, uh... off topic, but how? What's the jail manager of like that's? I guess we moving use... towards more integration with ZFS. Like right now, I'm just using IO Cage because it works and it's. It serves my purpose, but if I wanted to go more industrial, should I be looking at like the steel or? Uh, we we um we were an IO cage shop um until it became a support nightmare. Uh, we've moved to Bastille because of the lower um, amount of complexity in it. It's just shell scripts, so uh, yeah, we've we've moved to Bastille. It just manages fine and it works works well with um, uh, ZFS, and then. And then uh, Sanoid and Syncoid um, deal with the replication underneath that to other hosts. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and I put a, stuff. for the previous topic, I put a link in to an article we have on our website about doing Sanoid and Syncoid without needing uh, root privileges on either side. Oh, special. Uh, so you do the replication in a you know least privilege setup. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Inversely, yeah, from, from, I, from a oh, sorry, Michael, you go briefly. Inversely, I found it stunningly useful to simply push websites up from my laptop, unprivileged, over the internet to the web server, and it's just something I've wanted since the '90s. So yes, I, the unprivileged uh, execution is stunning. Go ahead. Is a uh, permit root um, this instead of just permit root login? Um, yes, no. There's always it is also without password um, feature in SSH. So um, we, unlike Alan, we're not too concerned about root being able to do um, the replication. However, we use a pool replication methodology. So the the host that's being snapshotted as the master host, it has zero access to the you know, the, the downstream or the replication host, the replication host connect to the master host to pull the snapshots from there. So we use uh, without password feature in uh, OpenSSH and then uh, pull, it, pull it that way. That way it's key-based authentication. You still can't log in as root using a password, um, but um, those machines that have uh, the authorized host, uh, that are authorized hosts can do the pull um, of what they need to do when they need to do it. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds exactly like what I'm what I was planning on. Something similar to that. Thanks. Cool. Hot off the jails call. Uh, Previous E14 will have a dot conclude feature, and combined with um, our let's see, uh, our the. Uh, jail.conf.d directory that can have configurations, which in turn can draw from includes uh, the in-base tools using, say, the service command should be quite user-friendly. So, of course, there's a time when you want a framework, but there's very active activities to improve the in-base tools. That sounds good, too, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I missed uh, this week, unfortunately. That's okay. We just triaged uh, PRs and reviews, so didn't miss anything. And the video is uploading as we speak. Awesome. Other topics. Um, welcome back, Jason. Um, an interesting one from the, from the first call was uh, multi-host safety, such that if you have, say, multi-path SAS to two controlling hosts to one large pool, what seatbelts are present and which ones are working, which ones are not. But a user was somewhat burned on Linux such that, uh, Alan, I'm curious if your team is working on those safety belts at all. Uh, so 
there's one built into ZFS called multi-mount protection. Um, it can fall short if you are on older versions of ZFS on Linux where the host ID on both machines might end up being zero and it thinks that uh, therefore it's the same machine and, it, and the, the protection doesn't help you. Uh, but if you have multi-mount uh, turned on, or uh, sorry, what's what's the property actually called? Multi-host. So if you have the, the pool property multi-host turned on, uh, when you try to import a pool, it, ZFS will read the last slot uh, for the Uber blocks uh, and see what the transaction group number is, then wait the average time it takes for a new transaction to show up, and then read it again. And if it is different, it will not complete the import because obviously the other host is still alive, and so you shouldn't fail over. Uh, so that feature is there, uh, but it can fail to protect you if the host ID on both sides is zero, which can happen on some older Linuxes. Uh, it's just a bug in, I don't know if it's Linux or ZFS, but um, I don't think it applies to any of the 2.x ones. But if you're on 0 0.8, I have seen that happen. Um, if you do get hit by your uh, pool getting imported on two heads at once and it gets damaged and won't import, uh, do get in touch. We've rescued pools for a couple of large organizations that have hit that problem. Uh, and so we have some expertise there. But outside of that, um, yeah, so the multi-mount protection is a good way to prevent it in the, the meantime. The one drawback is I have seen it have false positives. Uh, so pool was running with multi-mount or multi-host mode on, and then one of the disks started failing. And the multi-host mode thought the right failure was because the disk was in use by the other system. And so it suspended the pool and said you have to reboot. Uh, so it doesn't damage any data, but it can mean that if it has a false positive, it will suspend all rights to the pool and not let anything change on the pool on purpose to prevent uh, damage. But if it happened for a wrong reason, it's one of those you know, when your HA causes more downtime than not having HA does. So we are looking at uh, possibly fixing that, uh, trying to make it a little more robust and that, you know, a write error from a single disk, just because it happens to be the the Sentinel write you're doing, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the disk has been captured by the other system. Um, because the other main thing that, um, you can use in this case is what's called a SAS reservation. Uh, so if you're doing this over a SAS fabric, you can actually have one of the hosts claim the hard drive and say, I'm the only one that's allowed to write to this one. Uh, and then the other machine, while still being able to see the drive, if it tries to write to it, will get an error from the controller uh, with the write never getting to the hard drive. And that will prevent uh, the you know split brain situation. But um, yeah, and only if the other host goes off will that reservation go away, and then the the first host can take it. And there's a way to override it, uh, so you can specifically like force the the takeover or whatever. Um, but in this case, uh, the the case I was talking about where the multi mount mode had a false positive, it misinterpreted the failure to write to a failing disk as that disk has been captured by the other machine, and the write error was because I'm not in control of that disk anymore. So it was like, I'm going to stop everything and, and make sure we don't cause corruption. Uh, which, you know, depending on your use case, may still be the right reaction. But, um, you know, this user was not expecting, you know, they're recovering from a recent problem where multi-mount killed them. So they turned the mode on, and while restoring the data, one of the new drives fails, and it triggers a false positive in the protection for multi-mount, and they very uh, displeased with the way that was happening. What do you do? What are you using uh, for tooling to bring a pool online on the other host, Alan? Uh, so we've done a couple of different things. Um, some of our customers use a commercial software called RSF-1 from highavailability.com. Uh, and that has a like a one-time license fee. Uh, and it uh, adds it, it does the manages the reservations for you and has its own heartbeat on the disks in addition to a network-based heartbeat. 
and can manage things like moving the IP addresses between the hosts. Uh, and it's cross-platform to Linux, Solaris, and FreeBSD. Uh, although I've seen the Linux support not being that great on it. What about FreeBSD? It does have full support for FreeBSD. Um, so that's one option. Uh, other ones are just, uh, I think people have used Pacemaker on Linux and and a bunch of other options. Uh, also, just seeing people do it with uh, CARP and making DevD rules that say, you know, when when we become the master, fire Zupal import. Classic. Yeah. Does RSF1 help you at all for your applications? Like, hey, we have open connections and this file's open and we hand over that uh, it mostly... socket and components or it's just, oh, sorry, it doesn't, definitely doesn't do socket. Um, it does take care of like starting and stopping the iSCSI daemon and so on. Okay. Uh, so it does some, it has a concept of services and you can configure it. I've not done that much with it myself. Uh, the people I've used it for have mostly been using NFS. And so their VMware will deal with the fact that the NFS hiccups for a second, but that they can open the files. And so, you know, it doesn't seem to cause a lot of problems for them. Is there an NFS v4.2 notion of high availability or not? Someone so with NFS v4.2, the metadata server is not highly available, really. I think you have to provide that yourself some other way. Uh, but then what it would do with like a large file is it would put chunks of it on different servers and that you get better throughput by reading, you know, the first eight megabytes from the server and the second eight megabytes from that server or whatever. Uh, and I think, you know, in the protocol, there's a concept of, you know, you would do erasure coding or something to make sure that every block actually exists on a couple of nodes or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much of that NFSD provides itself versus how much of it is the protocol supports it. And if you were to build something around it, it would work <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, splitting up my data really doesn't sound super attractive unless it's on ZFS. Just Right. Well, the splitting up of the data is mostly about, you know, if uh, each of your NFS servers can only do 10 gigabit, uh, but you have many, many clients, if you're yep. spreading the data across a whole bunch of machines, then you're spreading the load out. And so okay. one client can pull more data than it might be able to otherwise. Fair enough. I'm happy to talk about other horror stories, but it's not yet quite Halloween. Yeah. Uh, the one I had questions about if anybody has uh, insights into the requirements uh, for something like a, a litigation hold in ZFS. Uh, so if you're familiar with a lot of online cloud uh, services like Office 365, uh, they have this concept of a, a litigation hold that basically prevents any data from being deleted. Uh, so you know you mark the file as deleted and it's not visible in the interface necessarily or whatever, but it means that no data is ever actually overwritten or destroyed. Uh, basically, you know, if you get handed a discovery notice as part of a lawsuit or something, and you have to make sure that you don't ever accidentally uh, destroy any evidence, it basically prevents any data from being deleted. Um, and so ZFS has the concept of a pool checkpoint, which would keep any old data from being changed, but it doesn't apply to if I create a new file and then delete it, it would still get freed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, not being a lawyer, I don't understand what exactly the requirements of a litigation hold are, but do know that there is some interest in having a feature like this for data management. Would that be it's like having multiple, check, multiple checkpoints? Uh, or more like, I think, a special checkpoint that just meant that any space that's ever allocated is never freed, rather than a checkpoint is just anything older than the checkpoint is mm -hmm. never freed. Uh, I, but like, there's got to be some way to eventually not run out of space. So uh, understand that exactly what's required. you've described aggressive snapshotting. You don't, you can go as far back and then lock it down perhaps, but I can't imagine how you would not conceivably run out of space if you're taking this sort of draconian position and say, well, nothing can truly disappear. I, I don't know. Changes, maybe that's somehow, <laughs> leave it to your lawyer, but so the data can 
uh, change, but it can't be deleted. So, well, what if the modification is effectively a deletion? So, <laughs> making it I, blank and so on. Yeah, right. I would just I, yeah. Uh, be interesting to know, like, is the requirement just that any data that existed at the time of the discovery does it doesn't get modified, uh, or is it that uh, you know we have to keep everything going forward as well? Because uh, that makes a big difference in how you would implement it. Um, I thought it would be more like, so looking back at the Enron saga, um, they kept too much data. So uh, a lot of the American companies, I can sort of attest to this, um, uh, changed there. So their email handling was, you know, retention span on their mailboxes, 12 months tops. So anything that you thought you were archiving, that's, that's gone too, because all that retention stuff went through. So for a litigation hold, um, I would expect it would be a snapshot point in time of that point in time. It's the data that's representative of that and the history of that data. So um, I wouldn't expect you need to hold it forward, like from that point onwards, because the discovery is discovering what happened in in, right. in the past history. So um, one would assume that a snapshot and a transfer of the snapshot of that data set at that point in time would be sufficient for a litigation hold. <clears throat> Because it's immutable. Yeah. Um, well, and so part of that is kind of fits into another feature we're looking at, especially for ransomware protection, is uh, we don't want to interfere with the ability to create and destroy snapshots all the time because you know most people have that scripted and and requiring two FA for that would cause endless headaches. Um, but there is a, a regular hold that you can put in ZFS. So you can basically put a lockout tag on a snapshot saying, you know, I'm using this snapshot for something with a keyword. Uh, and, you know, until somebody releases that snapshot with that keyword, that snapshot cannot be destroyed. Uh, you know, ZFS uses internally to make sure you don't destroy a snapshot while you're in the middle of replicating it, uh, sending it and so on. Um, so to deal with, you know, the threat of ransomware, especially if you have it integrated with uh, Windows for the, volume shadow copy stuff and so on, so that users can create and destroy snapshots. Uh, you don't want the ransomware somebody to learn to destroy your snapshots and, and you know, uh, mitigate your protection against ransomware. So if occasionally you could put a hold on a certain snapshot, like the one at the beginning of the month or something, uh, with a special setting that says, you know, in order to lift this hold, you need to run the release command, but also like provide a, a two-factor authentication key. Uh, some way to say, you know, certain operations or releasing this hold or whatever, uh, you know, these sensitive snapshots cannot be destroyed without uh, authenticating with a two-factor authentication of some kind, like a, a time-based token uh, or something. A uh, quick point on that. That sounds like a Windows question in effect, even though it might be uh, transparent behind the, scenes, like... behind the scenes. But uh, in practice, I've seen a large radio station uh, claim, hey, the best thing they ever did was just back up each Windows user's desktop each morning and everything on their desktop and, and send it off into somewhere in the data set elsewhere, snapshotted, and be have it waiting for the user to screw up. So if this 2FA would be in the power of the user, it'll probably be problematic. If it's at the administrator's end, okay, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes, in particular, this is don't allow this snapshot, which is really important, to be deleted without providing a second factor authentication. Well, so even if I'm root on the box. By the user or by the administrator? At which end? Well, normally well, only both. the administrator can delete snapshots, right? OK. Uh, but basically, even if somebody gets root on my server, they can't delete the snapshot because they don't have my phone that has the other half of this two-factor token or whatever. So hey, man, I've hoped for such a thing for quite some time. But yes, what mm -hmm. it looks like remains to be seen. Well, yes, especially because, like, you know, you don't want it to be can't delete any snapshots because right. then, you know, your Sanoid is going to be bothering you every 15 minutes <laughs> yep. or whatever. Yep. Um, but being able to to have a, a rotation of holds on certain snapshots and say, you know, you can't delete this snapshot until the hold is released and that hold requires the second factor. Would ZFS itself need to sprout 2FA support, like the uh, lowest level? Possibly. And then one of the other questions is, you know, where do we store the secret key for the 2FA for this? Yeah. As Matterns put it, well, you've got root. <laughs> it's kind of your box. Well, yeah, so, so you, um, kind of 
you know, one of the interesting angles that came out of this, looking at from FreeBSD side, is well, maybe there are certain bioctals or syscalls that, uh, you know, in certain circumstances would just return, you know, E need 2FA or something, and then you'd have to call it again while attaching the 2FA token before it would actually work. Uh, yes. Then I got off in the weeds thinking about how to make this super generic instead of actually solving the problem I was trying to solve. Yes, and I don't want to date myself, but secure levels, there could be a secure level where the system simply cannot, well, delete either, oh, ideally, flagged um, right, snapshots. Right, allow deleting snapshots, but not allow, so, yeah. But that's yeah. where that thought process took me years ago. Yep. Exactly. So... Fine, great. Uh, so, what is Office three sixty five doing? It's just transparent with magic in the background, I don't know. It's or just, does Amazon yeah, have a thing? Just, it's or... a setting you turn on, and then stuff happens. I don't know much more stuff about happens. it. Okay. Uh, any insights, Jason or Anthony? Have you seen that in practice? I did something similar, but it was much hackier. Um, I like your way much better. <laughs> oh. um, the one that I, the thing that I found difficult to get around was. Um, how do you snapshot a live VM? Um, so like if you're just, if you have a job that's snapshotting, say every five minutes of a VM that's running, and then you click on ransomware in that VM, you know, how can you make sure that you roll back everything? Obviously you can't roll back memory. Um, so I'm assuming there would be some sort of corruption from a live snapshot like that, or is there a proper way to do that other than shutting it down? Uh, so taking the snapshot of the VM while it's running uh, will be to some degree inconsistent, uh, but Beehive is doing the right thing so that you know if the application asked for a synchronous write, it will have you know only returned if ZFS completed it. So uh, while some data might be lost, it won't actually break things entirely. Um, it'll just be like the power went out suddenly uh, and the system will come back up. Um, there are some ways and some tools about trying to coordinate with the VM to have the VM like flush all of its ca uh, write cache to the disk, then take the snapshot uh, to try to synchronize that. And I know VMware has some support for that and I imagine other things too. Uh, but I know most people just, you know, depend on their applications doing the right thing as far as they're writing. Like if there's a database in the VM, it's going to be do doing synchronous writes correctly. And so it will just recover when you reboot it. And so, yeah, if it gets yeah. hit with the ransomware, you just stop it, uh, roll back and start it, and it, uh, it goes back to working. Um, what I would say about that is oftentimes the best practice would not actually be to do a rollback, but to clone the good snapshot and start the VM off that, keeping the copy of the VM that I hit with ransomware because you might need to do something with it, but also you might be able to extract slightly newer versions of some of the files that hadn't got encrypted yet uh, that'll be newer than the snapshot. And it gives you at least that option to go through it, whereas a rollback is going to destroy the old data immediately or the new data immediately or whatever. Yeah. Oh, for and, sure. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, my experience with the, the guest that's been operating with inside uh, that have been basically recovered. NTFS recovers no issues at all. Uh, and also um, OpenBSD's UFS or uh, Fast File System uh, 2 handles uh, it gracefully as well. So you can, like, basically we've had hard hard shutdowns of hosts where the UPS is depleted and the machines have just gone offline. And uh, ZFS has come up perfectly underneath it on the host and the guests fire up and they do what they need to do when they're, when they're starting up and um, do their preening and they come up no problems at all. So uh, from a from consistency inside that, from a hard hard crash or whatever, has uh, not been an issue on ZFS. And is it better to actually install ZFS on, like let's say you had a, I don't know, a Linux VM running under Beehive. Is it better to run the Z volume from Beehive and then just mount it as a normal disk and put LVM or whatever you want on it? Or should I put open ZFS on the Linux VM as well and do it that way? Um, there's, there's probably no right answer to that. Um, 
the I would do it both ways. I would have okay. the um, ZFS underneath and and layer a ZFS on top of that uh, again, um, just purely for the guest management. It allows the guest to have the controls of ZFS that it needs to. Um, it's a ZVOL or a, an image. Um, I've moved to images um, after um, uh, the performance improvement, the, the performance uh, results have shown that uh, using file-backed um, on a data set with the correct block size um, gives better performance for different types of workloads and that sort of stuff. ZVOL is typically what we use um, for where we're not concerned about performance, or whatever, we will use ZVOL on the host for VHive. And uh, that would, um, those ZVOLs will be part of like this. So for a Windows host, you know, you've got disk zero, disk one, disk two, and you feed those into there and then, and then let NTFS. Uh, drop onto that and the disk management side windows handle the the guest uh, system so i i usually tend to like to um leave the guest manage their their own file systems how they see fit unless you know you want to try and pump nfs back into um into a guest and so then that way that data set can be or the data that's inside that data set can be shared amongst multiple different systems okay that that's wonderful because, to be honest, I, I was not looking forward to trying to figure out which Linux to install ZFS in, in the middle of the big war of uh, what distribution is going to support it and what one's not, and it's just a big headache. So if I don't have to yeah. deal with GNU Linux, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's fine. Just um, you know, like VMware, VMware handles its disks uh, like. You know, for the for your operating system, be it KVM or Beehive and FreeBSD, using OpenZFS underneath it to host your VMs, and then and then feed feed um, whatever your flavor is um, to the guest uh, as a data set to then let the guest manage it. And then that way, as the guest or the um, so say your Linux inside that guest VM changes its desire. It goes, oh, I'm using XFS one week, and then they ch decide to change to JFS the next week. Um, and, you know that they and their migration tools are based around that. You're not trying to then you know manage a migration where you've done something that's out of support from a file system point of view. Just let just let them do their thing, and then you're, no, you're safe. That sounds perfect because yeah, I get. That got old a long time ago. Like, it's like, this is shiny. Let's change everything. It's like, no, it doesn't work. Let's stay with things that work. <laughs> yep. Yep. At the end of the day, it's like, I've, if I get hit by, like, I can craft things and make it work, you know, squeeze every single ounce of it, but you get hit by a bus. It's like somebody else has got to come in and try and decipher what you've done. And it's just like, nah, just make it easy for the support people to come in and say, here's your guest and they know what they do and they know what they're doing. So. Yeah, Chase, I got a quick question for you on that point. Yeah. I do want to run some things by you, Anthony. Uh, Jason, did you have trouble with Zvols in production or only when benchmarking? No, never had problems with Zvols in production at all. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't experience the performance issues in Zvols that Linux users seem to have reported. Ah, yeah. um, so FreeBSD doesn't seem to have that. However, there is a marginal improvement if you um, using data sets and you know truncate your image file onto that data set with a specific block size, um, depending on the type of workload that's going on there. So you can squeeze a bit more out of it if you control it that way. So FreeBSD, we've got we've got the option to feed whatever into Beehive, so it's not not a drama really. And I asked because. Uh, Daniel B is quite sure he saw a bug, if you will, on FreeBSD where his his benchmarks would tip over Z balls, Z balls, but in production it was not an issue. So he's trying to chase that down because it it may have may, may be the reason that they have a bad reputation for some. But yes, if you've heard of issues on Linux, that can be a different issue. Uh, Anthony, if you're doing ZFS on ZFS, definitely do not start ca double caching. So you want metadata cached on the VM, but not your 
basically all data, which the ARC does very well, but let the host do that. Don't let the VM do yeah. that. Just a thought. Just to not like shoot yourself in the foot. Um, yeah, right right now I think I'm doing the same thing Jason's doing and that I just use uh data sets. The Z ball that I have is just basically one drive that I just want separated because it's on its own little machine in space. Okay. Um and that's the only reason for it. It's yeah, I do the image thing the, the same same way too. I have a quick finding from this week, which is that the Debian no cloud images, no cloud meaning no password. I learned that. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, <laughs> they there is a bug that's in Debian for auto expansion, but you can get around it. However, you can take those disk images just like the FreeBSD VM images and boot them under Beehive, essentially the raw image, not the like VMDK, but that might take conversion. Or you can boot them on raw hardware. So they are very flexible and it's an authentic installation. And so for slamming, say, Nextcloud into it, it was a much shorter path than anyone who's pushing and publishing a, an appliance because rarely they get it right. So that was a pleasant surprise, how well it worked. That's that's interesting to hear. I hope to, I, I have a script, Imagine, which takes an image and puts it wherever you want it, be it a VM expanded or you name it. However, Imagine could spread Debian support without much effort. You need things like uh, vol mode equals one. No, it was uh, show the UUIDs, sorry, confusing the two. And then some utilities in ports. But with those utilities, you can mount it just fine. You can do the grow FS. You can do the all the all the things. I was quite impressed once I figured out the, the UUID bug, if you will, that they fixed in February, but haven't quite pushed out to their VM images somehow. Thank you, Debian. Uh, Michael, I've got to go. Um, okay. It's, hey, this it's has been, been a great, great conversation. Yeah, great to see you. It's been a while since you've had a call and feel free to check out those videos. They are there pretty much for you. I do. Hours upon hours. Yeah. I'm I'm actually going to um download them and put them into a um a podcast feed so then I can blast it through my podcast player. So I'll um I'll see what I I can do there. I'm I'm planning to stand up a um a car a cast ad pod instance so um cool. I can feed it in there and everybody on Mastodon can then just like Hoover it down or buy an RSS feed or whatever. So. Awesome. Oh, and a point that. I buried is that the entire focus of the last meeting was this quiescence on databases on virtual machines. I propose that we just plowed into it. I absolutely welcome your stories. And I ran some tests. There is what is the either free command in Linux. And I just let a Linux box run and watch how much, how many writes are cached, but not pushed out to disk. And I hope to achieve as close to as possible a you know, one to two relationship, one to one relationship where we know it is pushed to disk on the VM. We know that's a good time to snapshot it. We then you know, round trip say, look, we know this was successful. And all the various VM tools and add-ons do that in some way, but often it's just a glorious sync command. So. You know, the good old days in the 80s, it's like sink, 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 shut down. So, yeah. So, anyway, I absolutely welcome your your insights and experiences. Horror stories here. Anyway, a pleasure. And uh, perhaps we just call it there. Cool. Very okay. informative. Thanks. Have a great day. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.